Right. Where's the grape? It sounds like a simple question, but the response reveals a lot more than the location of a grape. It unlocks a tiny window into the mind of a non-human animal, the bonobo. I'm Zeke Darwin, a science teacher that's been breaking down studies that I find interesting online for the last five years. During that time, one trend that has repeatedly been made clear is that historically, scientists had greatly underappreciated animals, both their intelligence and the way they see and interact with the world around them. From bumblebees playing, fish recognizing themselves in the mirror, crows memorizing faces and spreading information about which humans are bad to other crows, to pigs locking in as a response to humans cheering them on while they're playing video games. Animals are much more aware of the world around them than some scientists used to believe. And anecdotal reports had suggested that in the wild, apes would choose when to alert each other to nearby snakes based on whether or not the other ape had seen the snake. If this was really occurring, it meant that ape number one was able to get inside the mind of ape number two and see the world from their point of view. To test these reports in a controlled laboratory setting, researchers with the John Hopkins University Social and Cognitive Origins Group sat bonobos down across from them. They would then have a person place one grape under one of the three cups. After that, they asked the bonobo, Got any grapes? No, just kidding. But they did say, where's the grape? Notice in this video, the bonobo clearly makes an attempt to signal where that grape was hidden. Hmm, where's the grape? Where's the grape? Now compare that to this second video. Where's the prick? In the second video you just watched, that bonobo was uninterested. There was no attempt made to show that human where the grape was hidden. The difference between the two trials was the ability for the human observer to actually watch where the person was placing the grape. When the vision of the observer was blocked, the ape knew the observer actually didn't know where the grape was, so he would help the person out. However, in the second video, the ape was able to see that that person watched where the grape was hidden, and they were able to kind of determine that there was no reason for them to actually point it out. They were able to see through the person's point of view. It's extremely hard to try to understand the inner workings of our own mind, our consciousness, and it's infinitely harder to try to do that with other animals that we can't even have a dialogue with. But experiments like this show that we can continue to test these abilities, and in my opinion, with what I've seen with AI, I think we could have some breakthroughs in the next couple of decades regarding human and non-human animal communication. Modern sheep, Ovis Eris, haven't always existed. They evolved from an ancestral population of mouflon, not through evolution by natural selection, but instead their evolution was guided by the people they were living alongside. Paleogenomics, the study of analyzing ancient DNA to see how populations of animals and ecosystems have evolved over time, has quickly became one of my favorite fields in the world of science. In order to better understand the origins of our modern domestic sheep, a team of researchers analyzed the genomes of 118 different sheep that lived across Europe. Eurasia over the last 12,000 years. The evidence told an interesting story of migration over time, and not just the migration of sheep. The evidence suggests that somewhere around modern-day Turkey, over 11,000 years ago, these wild sheep, mouflon, began living alongside humans and going through the process of domestication. By 8,000 years ago, the genomes show a distinct split among the populations. The population in Europe revealed evidence that farmers were already selectively breeding their sheep for specific traits that they valued. The team identified a gene called KIT that rapidly became more common in the population and this gene has been associated with white coats in modern day livestock. Think about that, 8,000 years ago, people understood the mechanisms of evolution enough to change the population dynamics of their flocks and make specific things become more common over time 
by breeding the animals that had those traits. 1,000 years later, the genome suggests that sheep were spreading westward within the Fertile Crescent as people expanded out of the early cities of Mesopotamia. More migrations were revealed through the DNA of the sheep. Dr. Kevin Daly, the first author of the paper, had this to say about it. One of the most striking discoveries was a major prehistoric sheep migration from the Eurasian steppes into Europe during the Bronze Age. This parallels what we know about human migrations during the same period, suggesting that when people moved, they brought their flocks with them. Zika virus was first discovered in the Zika forest of Uganda in 1947. It's spread by mosquitoes, and honestly, the side effects, they typically aren't that serious. It's not going to be life-threatening for most people. However, if you are pregnant, it can be very dangerous. The virus can spread from the mother to her unborn child and lead to birth defects, specifically serious birth defects dealing with the brain. In a study published on January 30th, researchers from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine uncovered a concerning strategy used by the Zika virus. It actually manipulates the DNA within its host's skin so that the skin starts emitting chemical signals that are more attractive to mosquitoes. Yes, that means if you get this virus, it's going to hijack your DNA so that your skin actually attracts more mosquitoes. And from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. What better way for a virus that spreads by mosquitoes to spread more than by attracting more mosquitoes? These VOCs, they're what these chemical compounds are called. I did a video not too long ago about truffles, a type of fungi that grows underground and they produce these chemical compounds so that animals like pigs will dig them up. So really interesting compounds that are produced by our skin due to this virus. While it does sound scary and it's not fun to have more mosquitoes, understanding this mechanism can potentially help us better fight back against Zika virus and that's very important especially right now. Prior to the 21st century, Zika was known to live within a narrow belt along the equator, from Africa to Asia. But at some point, the virus spread east, all the way across the Pacific Ocean to the Americas. Brazil was hit really hard by this five or six years ago. The more I think about that number, the more I think I'm way off. Like, COVID has been five years ago now? I'll throw the real number up on the screen. Time's moving fast. Anyways, back to the video. As the climate changes, the habitable zone of this virus is also changing. A warmer planet is really good for a virus that has evolved to live along the equator, and we are seeing the impact of this as more and more people are getting Zika. In fact, a study published in 2020 found that warming temperatures could expose more than 1.3 billion new people to Zika virus by the year 2050. I always want to end this show with some good news because I know in the world of science it often seems like the good news doesn't exist. It does. Just this last week, a team of researchers potentially saved the future for a really interesting species of frog called Darwin's frog. This species has a really interesting behavior. The fathers, once they notice the embryos inside of the eggs start to move around, they go up and they swallow the eggs. And then those eggs, they are stored in the vocal sac where the tadpoles eventually emerge. And then the tadpoles live for days within that vocal sac until they're ready and they're a little bit more mature and the froglets are able to survive. And then the dad opens his mouth and lets the babies out. This species is already endangered, but in 2023, this specific population I'm going to talk about in this story, they were exposed to chytrid fungus. And if you've never heard of chytrid fungus, it is a very serious thing going on right now that is really affecting a lot of amphibians in really negative ways, driving some populations entirely extinct. Since 2023, when chytrid fungus got to this location, this population has decreased 90%. So the writing seemed to be on the wall. This team of scientists wanted to re cover some of this population before it was too late. They went into the southern Chilean forests, they were able to capture over 50, and they brought them over 7,000 miles back to London. Once in London, 11 of those male frogs, they opened their mouths and 33 babies came out. So a population seems to have been saved from the potential chytrid overwhelming that forest, and now, well, 
It's hope for the future. The good thing about this chytrid fungus is we're learning a lot about it. There are some groups trying to counter it. I know Colossal has been talking about some of the research they are doing on it. So hopefully if we can continue saving these populations before it's too late, one day we can reintegrate them back into their habitat without that chytrid fungus. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I tried to keep it under 10 minutes. I'm thinking about what would work best in a classroom, but I'm also hoping people just like hanging out on their couch, enjoy this as well. Thank you everybody who has kind of given me this chance. I have a Patreon now and that's really kind of funding this. And my goal is to create a science news weekly program that comes out the same day every week so you can just consistently know it's going to be here. And I just want to keep people up to date on the stuff that I think is interesting like I've been doing on TikTok for five years. But this, I think, has some potential to really bring it into the classroom, not only help students but also teachers because the more you learn about what's going on around the world, the more we are able to give better answers when kids ask questions. So thank you everybody who has supported me on Patreon. I'll be sending out things within the next week. And I wanted to mention, if anybody wants to like do this on behalf of your class, let me know. When you sign up for the Patreon, send me like your class name you want on there and I'll add that in instead. So thank you.